Judith Nyland and I have written this book called De Crone. People say that I wrote it, my name's on it, but in fact it was actually inspired. It was a collaboration and for those who are writers um, you know that once the muse lands and hits you you become possessed and that was really um, the situation with this book. This book came to me um, because of the journey I'm on as elder in Crone and a lot because I really, I really feel that in these times, especially in this country, it's so important that the elder wisdom, that those of us who hold elder knowledge and experience have got to have their voices heard right now. And actually that's the tradition worldwide, ancient times, it was the elders that kept the stories and kept the vision for the people. And so this book is really a call to do that. It's a call to uh, do what's necessary, leave behind what no longer serves you, let that stuff go, pick up the skills, the wisdom that you have, and march through that threshold of elder to crone and make a difference with your life. And that is, in a nutshell, what this book's all about. The name of the book is Crone, Call to Crone. And yes, I chose that word intentionally, obviously. Um, and it's provocative. It's not a word that's comfortable for people. The other word that's not comfortable for people is hag because we have all those Halloween images of crone and hag and warty noses and things like that. In fact, if you look at the etymology, crone comes from the word for crown. And if you think about mm, Catholic and other Christian traditions where you see these ancient paintings with these glows, these sort of halo glows behind their head, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a crown of wisdom. We're talking about that light energy that emanates when that's present. That's crone. Hag, the etymology, is actually Hagio, which means holy. So Crone and Hag were revered names for ancient women in ancient times until, you know, the Middle Ages and the etymology and our dictionary started to come into place. You need to know, not believe, like believe in the tooth fairy, believe in Santa Claus, you need to know that you hold divine light within you. That's it, bottom line. Now, if you don't believe that, working with me, being on a journey with me, being in this gathering here, um, it's probably not gonna be for you. But everything I do is about an invitation to wake up and empower the light, the divine light, the divine wisdom that you hold because it's in there. So I tell people, um, you know, I'm probably not going to give you anything that you don't already have. I can give you some ideas. I can talk a little bit about some of the Irish mystical traditions of like Druids and wise women and those kinds of things because that's my heritage and that's a lot of what I work with. And I can give you those information. So, you know, I have stories and I can talk to you about the history. But at the bottom of it, I'm not giving you anything you don't already have. Um, all of what I do is offer bits and pieces and stories and insights so that you can come to a place of celebrating and claiming that light. Our lives are so busy. We spend so much time in our heads. We're thinking through, we're you know, watching the news, everything is all mental. This is an opportunity and a call to drop down into the soul wisdom that we own. The wisdom of our soul, which actually, as many of you will know, is uh, DNA ancestry. This is wisdom that comes to us from our ancestors. And there's, you know, they're starting to prove scientifically what many of us have known for a long time is that this is not a mystery, that 
wisdom, ancient wisdom, ancient knowing is embedded in our very DNA. And so this is an opportunity to wake that up. I always encourage people to uh, really examine where they are on their journey of elder, okay? And really, truly, what needs to be left behind. When we become elder, there's that opportunity for us to put down what's no longer serving us, put down the baggage of old hurts, of anger, fear, pain, and grief, to really let those go, and to understand that those are burdens that are probably not going to help us. Then the opportunity to really think about and examine what am I, who am I right now? Because kind of who we are at this stage is who we got to work with. So accepting I am who I am, what are the, what are the gifts of that? Sometimes what's not comfortable for people to think about is death because my perspective on this is that when we are able to move through that threshold of elder, of crone, we are now in the last phase of our journey on this planet, right? We are moving towards time, we are moving towards being ancestor. And I like to look at it not as getting older, 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 and dropping off a cliff and dying, but really, Elderhood, cronehood, is about moving through that landscape, mystical landscape, of the ancestors, becoming much more comfortable with the knowing that I am going to die, so it's not something I'm going to avoid, it's something I'm going to look at and understand, and my journey reflects my comfort with that, my knowing of that, it also reflects that I'm going to take more time to be in meditation, to be with the spirit world, to be with the ancestors as we move. So when we've been with people who are dying, and I know this is, you, many of you will know this, what happens right before they die, oftentimes they start talking to those on the other side, right? They start having these conversations with people that they're seeing, people that they know. And my thought is, okay, let's back that up a lot. Let's get more comfortable with those on the spirit world. They used to call this crazy. In ancient cultures, in ancient communities, in ancient tribes, those who lived kind of on the edge of reality were those who could talk to the spirit world, those who could communicate with the spirit world, those who would be much more comfortable. So part of what we'll explore is what it means to be on a journey of becoming ancestor and weaving with the ancestors. I also think that there's something that is, in addition to being mythic crone, um, what it means to, uh, to write my story of, of that. There are uh, some things that we're called to. And if we look at the archetypes hmm, of elder, if we look at the archetypes of crone, there's some things that start to emerge. And one is they were in right relationship with the sacred. They owned that space. They knew it. They were sacred people. They were mystics. They became more mystical. They knew what it meant for them on their journey to be in right relationship with the sacred. I also know that there's an opportunity here to re-examine and to name what it means to be in right relationship with the earth, with the natural world, with our mother. We are going back to, whether buried or cremated, we are going back to our mother from where we came. And so, speaking for the earth, speaking for, you know, the, um, the planet, uh, which is especially important now. And then the third leg of that is what does it look like for me as an elder and a crone to be in right relationship with community? Okay. What does it mean for me to be a story keeper, a wisdom keeper? 
what does it mean for me to be elder? In this culture, we have the story of people get old, they retire, and they go to Arizona from here. They go away, they disappear, we don't listen to them, we don't want to hear them. But that is not what elders and crones used to be about. They used to hold the vision and the stories for the people. They used to be the ones that would be the ones who were sought, the council was sought for everything from going to war to how to structure the community to how to divide up community land and possessions. So what does it mean for us to step into a place of right relationship and community? Our families, our friends, our local communities, our national community, and for me, our global community. Because being grandmothers, mm -hmm. being grandmothers, not just to my biological family, but being grandmothers to the world, being the grandmothers. And I think that wisdom, not only is it something that's important for us to own and to manifest, we also begin to make the demonstration to those who are gonna come after us of what it looks like to be on this journey. Everything from what it looks like to cross that threshold to what it looks like to die. It's our job to show our people how this is done. The journey of crone, the journey of elder, and the journey of death. But with a title like crone, people often wonder, well, should men read this book? Or should men come to a workshop? And actually, yeah, absolutely. What I find is that I speak from my experience, and so I'm speaking to women because I'm an elder and I'm working with my sisters. But at the same time, I found that a lot of men have bought the book and are really um, resonating with much of what I've already talked about in terms of what it means to be on the path of elder, what it means to have an opportunity to let go what no longer serves you, what it means to be mythic, what it means to be archetypical elder, what are those ancient tribal you know, um, uh, traditions and gatherings that were both men and women, the elders of the tribe, and also the being in right relationship with the earth and the sacred and community. All of those are just as important for men as they are for women. And this just happens to be a little more slanted to women. I do talk about the, um, the ancient wise women of Ireland and the Sheelinigigs, and those are female archetypes. But that's only part of what we're going to talk about. And so, yes, I would welcome and invite men to join us if they are called, as well as women. I would love to meet with you. I would love to see you at this gathering. It's going to be um, an inspired time because you're going to be there. Um, and hopefully it will be an inspiring time. And I would be honored if you would join us. So thank you very much.